Right. I think we can get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another CAD seminar series. Today we have Professor Deb Mishra. He's an associate professor at the Oklahoma State University, Civil and Environmental Engineering. Before that, he was an assistant professor at Boise State University in Idaho. He got his PhD from UIUC in 2012. So after the theme of the uh, and lecture this semester. He's a homeland, Carl Lundin. Before that, he got his master's in CE uh, from Texas Tech and a bachelor in civil engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology in Kanpur. He is the chair of the subcommittee of unbound aggregate material for the transportation research board. He is the founding member of the Young Transportation Geotechnical Engineers Committee. A committee formed under the International Society for Solid Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering. Dr. Mishra has research interest in the generic areas of interest infrastructure, materials, pavement engineering, railroad engineering, and transportation geotechnics. In particular, his research has encompassed the following topics performance and monitoring of transportation infrastructure through, through advanced instrumentation. Design and development of advanced laboratory equipment for infrastructure material characterization, micromechanical analysis of coarse grain geomaterials through, through discrete element modeling, and numerical and analytical modeling of transportation, pavement, and railroad infrastructure. Today he's here with us. So let's please uh, welcome Professor Bishop. Oh. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Javier, can you can you guys hear me clearly? Yes, you can. Okay, and the screen is visible and everything. Yes, sir. All right, excellent. So, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, you know, the the Kent seminar always brings a lot of nostalgic feelings, as uh, uh, some of you know and some of you may have heard. I spent eight years in uh, in Atrial. At ICT and everything, and and every Thursday Kent seminar was a big part of the life. So really, really uh, an honor to be back uh, talking to uh, fellow ICT folks and stuff. And uh, the today my talk is about a project we just finished for the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, a lot of questions, uh, some answers, and some food for thought. Essentially, is what we are going to talk about. Um, and this is my, uh, this slide set has been put together by my PhD student, Kostov Chatterjee, who I think is online as well. Uh, he's doing his PhD on, on pavement modeling instrumentation and stuff like that. So the topic is data reduction analysis and sensor survivability on smart runway. I know for a fact that several, uh, a couple of researchers, at least at Illinois, are involved in some way or the other in the smart runway in, uh, endeavor. So this is not something very new to several folks. First of all, acknowledgements. I always start my pro talks with acknowledgements because towards the end, you are rushed for time uh, and stuff. Uh, Dr. Wayne Hodo, Jeb Tingle, Jesse Doyle, and Harold Tommy Carr at ERDEC. Uh, so this is a study sponsored by the US Army Corps of Engineers, the Engineer Research Development Center uh, at Vicksburg, Mississippi. And uh, these are the folks that helped quite a bit, their technical contribution and discussions and everything is greatly, greatly appreciated. So what we're gonna talk about is the introduction, what kind of sensors are there, what we did in our study and what are the findings and what are the challenges and what are the things that ERDEC is probably still trying to figure out or will have to figure out as they keep moving forward in this endeavor. So first of all, a little introduction about what the Smart Runway Project is. So this is actually a project in Hill Air Force Base, uh, the runway in Hill Air Force Base in Utah. And this is a unique Air Force Base. Uh, it, this was selected for, a, for several reasons. One of them is that portion of Utah actually does experience four distinct seasons. And also this Air Force Base is an operational Air Force Base and it does experience uh, you know, fighter jets, cargo aircrafts, just refueling aircrafts and all of those things. So different kind of aircraft, different multi-wheel uh, aircrafts uh, or gear configurations. And also this is a long-term performance monitoring study that ERDEC initiated 
because they wanted to see the performance of these pavement structures under not only aircraft loading, but also the environmental effects as well. And why is that is because, of course, I mean, we can do all sorts of, uh, you know, modeling studies, lab studies or something, but, but uh, you know, uh, implementation or, or testing them in the field in the long term is actually very, very beneficial. And not a lot of studies are actually found on the military side of things on in, when it comes to runway uh, for testing, like full scale studies and stuff like that, right? So this is the reason this was uh, taken care of, uh, this was undertaken. Uh, the disclaimer is that I was not involved in the undertaking part of this study. So this study actually had initiated, then I, I, I was given a small project to do what I'm trying to present. Uh, in this talk, okay. So the objective is to install state-of-the-art sensor technology, monitor pavement response to military aircraft loading, develop a web-based database, and to calibrate and validate pavement design and evaluation models. And if you, uh, if you, some of you may be aware, there is actually a lot of things going on. There is, there is a project initiative called Jedi that actually is going on for the, by the Army Corps of Engineers. And then they, they developed like a uh, like a uh, upgraded version of what is called the C-Flex. And that is actually what Professor Tumler, I don't know if he's in the room, by the way. By the way, he was my advisor for my postdoc as well as PhD. So pretty much everything I know is uh, thanks to him. Uh, so uh, he, he, did a, he did a major, major work on the C-Flex C development. You all probably have attended their talks, how Han Wan's uh, talks and stuff like that. Uh, but, but this is kind of one of the ob object uh, initiative is that, you know, all the data that you collect, uh, uh, it goes into uh, validation of those models or checking what the models are doing and stuff like that. And, and if you look at the, uh, the collaboration, it was ERDEC, it was Dynatest. Dynatest was actually given a subcontract to install all the sensors. Uh, in fact, one of our very own graduates, uh, Phil Donovan, who is with ARA now, uh, he was uh, in Dynatest at that time and he took care of that project quite a bit. And Woolpot Enterprises actually fixed what is their web-based interface, which is where all the data gets recorded and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, what are the sensors? Uh, you know, there are about 98 sensors. There are strain gauges, earth pressure cells. Uh, MDDs, multi-depth uh, deflectometers, that's something that's actually very close to my heart. We, we did quite a lot of that in my, our railroad project. Then there is Bender Element. This was Professor Tumler's group. Uh, Smart Rocks, actually, Hai Wang's group out of Penn State Altoona, again, one of the Illinois graduates. Uh, uh, and then environmental sensors. There are some laser distance meters and some GPR targets and stuff like that that were put, put in there. Okay, this is kind of a kind of a uh, um, schematic, as you can see, this is, uh, this is the uh, center line. Uh, hold on, is my pointer visible or should I go to the, maybe a laser? Uh, so this is the center line and this is the, you know, east side, uh, west side. And then the, the sensors are in, uh, you know, installed like this. There's row one, two, three, four, all the way to row 11 column one, two, three, four and stuff. And every legend actually corresponds to what kind of sensors are there. Like for example, these, uh, these uh, circles are EPCs. And then, uh, there, then there are also like layers, like for example, a gray circle would actually be a base on top of the base. An orange circle will be on top of the sub base. A tan circle would be on top of the subgrade and stuff like that. One thing I would like to highlight at this stage before we go, deeper is that you see these laser distance meters, they're basically made in a way that, you know, when an aircraft passes, you the laser beam actually there, one is at this angle, one is at a predefined angle at both ends. And the laser ray is supposed to intersect the wheel and then reflect, uh, uh, and then you have, a, uh, you have a time signature of that. So the idea is that if a wheel comes here, then first it will intersect this vertical one and then the other one probably somewhere here and then from similarly here as well. So you can actually do some basic trigonometry and stuff and find out what is the speed of the aircraft, what is the distance between gear configuration. So you can actually back calculate or estimate what kind of gear, uh, gear configuration there is. But there are several challenges and I will go into that when we get deeper into the project. But I want you to 
they uh, like remember how this laser setup is. Okay, we'll get into that later. So these are some pictures I got from Erdek. This is during their installation. As I said, uh, installation is not something that we were my research group was part of, but this is where the sensors were put into and and stuff. When we were actually given the project, we were given uh, the task of the following, saying that, okay, we are getting a bunch of data from all these sensors, okay? Now that data, first of all, it's 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 like, uh, there are some triggers, like for example, there are, if there, there, there are some detection uh, algorithms in there so that it triggers when there is a uh, there is an aircraft coming and that aircraft is, is recorded as an event. Okay, so that's called an event. So there may be 10 events per day, 20 events per day, depending on what kind of aircrafts are going. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of sensors, there's a lot of data, right? So how do you identify what is actually a meaningful data? What is probably a false trigger, a false uh, kind of a uh, signal? How do you first filter the data to find out meaningful signal? And then how do you reduce the quantity of data that is in there? Because otherwise, you know, just 20 events or 100 events that you download, that can become like several gigabytes of data. Um, I think I have one slide about the size of the files or maybe I removed it. But it, it essentially is a data reduction filtering kind of a pro approach is, is something that we, we are supposed to develop for them. And then also we went on much further and I'll show you some of the stuff that we have been doing. So this is basically the big data challenge, right? We have huge amount of data and we can have contaminated data. Why? Because this is a sense, this is not a you know controlled environment or anything. So this is a deployment. So with time, so today you record a data, the earth pressure cell gives you a very good reading. Tomorrow, that data may not be very good. So how do you have a continuous reliability check or, or survivability check of the sensors? And how do you make sense of this big data, right? This, this huge amount of data that you have. So this is a cartoon that I like. Uh, all the time is a lot of times we just get flooded with data and don't know what to do with it. So what the objective was how the ERDEC can actually make meaningful use uh, of the data. So all the instrumentation data may not be required uh, for the uh, pavement analysis. And also we are going to optimize the usage of this data to improve DOD's pavement analysis and design practices, which is exactly the big picture of the JEDI, the C-Flex, C-Slab, and all of that coming together. Right. So one of the things that uh, that they have is this smart runway website, which is basically developed, I mean, maintained by Wilpert Technology, but it is Aldex, uh, it, it is owned by Aldex. And then, uh, uh, by the way, those of you who don't know, ERDC is what's called Aldex, if there is anybody who doesn't uh, know the acronym. Uh, but uh, uh, so our, this is the website where you can actually go to an event and you can pull up some data. But you can also get some raw data, which we were able to get. And we were able to make sure that, okay, if you are trying to do analysis of 200 events, nobody is going to pull up those things manually and analyze them visually and then make notes and everything together. So you need bulk processing algorithms. You need bulk processing systems to do this. So for example, this is one example signal of a pressure versus time. And as, as, a, as you can see, there are some legends here. R8 shows row eight, C7 is column seven, PC stands for pressure cell and TB stands for top of base. So this is, this is a pressure cell that is on row eight and column seven and is placed on top of the base. And this is an example signal. And this is basically a strain versus time from a ASG. Uh, a lateral asphalt strain gauge. L stands for lateral and T, st oh, sorry, longitudinal and T stands for transverse and stuff like that and top of base again. So this is kind of the example data that you can get. And again, if you go to the raw data, this is basically how it looks, okay? Uh, it's very noisy and you need to identify which is the good data, what is the meaningful region and stuff like that. And if you go into, so, and civil engineers not always are the best or the most knowledgeable about signal processing, right? And, and, and I know several of you in the in the group, uh, in the audience may be working on things like GPR and stuff where, where signal processing is like a very, like piece of cake for you because you do that on a daily basis. But not all pavement engineers are actually 
very conversant with signal processing and filtering and what filter to use and stuff like that. So one of the things we did is try to compare some of the filters and try to propose one that would work. Okay, so, so excessive noise mitigation and stuff like that. So this is uh, so this is another data. This is just raw, pulled, pulled out, right? So does this have any meaning or, or this is completely garbage? Is this just noise that can be filtered or this is useless data, right? This is basically what, what we were trying to first access, right? So then we tried to look into filtering techniques. So because Aldec wanted us to say, hey, which filter should we implement on a, on a general basis? Like if we have all the raw data, can we pull up all the data together, write like a Python script, and then uh, and then just apply one filter so that everything gets back processed? Because just one event doesn't tell us anything, right? We What is the objective? You are looking at long-term performance. You can compare months to months, season to season. You can compare you know, different aircraft types and all of that. So, so they wanted us to compare some of the filter types and develop some of the data analysis techniques. Okay, so my student, what he did is we we did a lot of you know literature review and stuff like that. Uh, in fact, one of the very recent papers by I think it was uh, Arman uh, um, and and Professor Alkali's group they did some filtering uh, work as well. I think they used something like a Sabit Spigoli, and we we used that as a reference as well. Uh, and, and and we 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 looked at all of those. Uh, stuff and then we compared like moving average median filter sabitsky gulai low pass filter now here is the thing a lot of times we see papers that say that this paper this filter was used but the, the nobody talks about why did you use this filter is it actually better than the others uh for for our purposes okay i'm not going into electrical engineering details or anything i'm talking about what kind of meaningful data you can extract from a pavement standpoint and what is of interest to us and is this actually better what we actually found is that as long as your window size you select properly, honestly, all the filters were pretty much working very, very similar to each other. Okay, and this we tried on several hundreds of events and stuff downloaded that as long as the, you know, this is, for example, after a lot of work, you know, it was like window size 51 um, is was decided for moving average and median for the service people, I also 51 for a degree of polynomial of two and low pass butter worth of eight and frequency of frequency 300 hertz for all the signals that were there we were able to make it work and then they all gave reasonable results okay and again the idea is not to talk from an electrical point of view or signal processing point of view but i'm talking about pavement application is this what is right and this is the comparison Basically, so moving average, median, Sabitsky Golai, low pass. For each signal, we detected the peak and then we subtracted 500 points. So went to the left by 500, went to the right by uh, five, uh, sorry, left by 500 and 1000, and went to the right by 500 and 1000. We tried to compare the values. As you can see, it's 33.25, 33.33, 39, sorry, 39.25, 39.33, 39.73, 39.84. Here, 38.69, 38.75, 39.17, 39.25. So for all practical purposes, for all what we are interested in from a pavement analysis, performance monitoring point of view, we are talking about like 0 0.5 KPA difference of stress and stuff. So this is this was not actually uh, uh, at all out of uh, any realm or a practicality and stuff. So we just said that, okay, all of them are working fine. So we just picked the Savitsky Gulai. That is because, you know, some literature did that and some talked about better and we just kept working with that. So that was the very first task, you know, identifying to them that, you know, what filter type you can use and is one filter type. It's, can, like, can somebody tomorrow say, oh, you did use this filter type. So you are losing out on all the in meaningful data. You are not getting anything. For all practical purposes, we said, no, that's not true. You're getting good. Uh, you can use any of that. So then comes, how do you identify a, an event? Like for example, when an aircraft comes, you have like an event you that sensors get triggered and maybe there is like two seconds or three seconds of silence and then the peak and then again, three or four seconds of silence. So do you really need all of that data into your computer memory when you are trying to batch process all the files? The answer is no. You need to isolate the event and kind of reduce the data, cut off the tails and stuff like that, right? So that is what we did. It was a relatively simple machine learning application. We didn't do anything out of the world. This is basically something similar to K-means cluster. So we basically identified the anchor points and then tried to find out, you know, 
which cluster the data uh, uh, fell into. We scaled the data because otherwise you'll see the X axis goes up to 3.5 and the Y axis goes to 40, right? So when you do like a scaling, uh, without scaling, this will actually mean become very weird. So you have to do like a one-to-one -one scaling and stuff. And then basically what we did is this is the raw data then there is some filtered data. We filtered that using the service tubuli, and we found the anchor points, and then we, we identified the peaks, the interest point, and then we shortened the data significantly. So think about it here, folks. Zero to 3.5 is the event that you got, right? But now you have 1.36 to 1.46, so basically 0 0.1 seconds. So imagine the amount of data reduction you are talking about from a practicality point of view, and you are reducing the computer memory requirements when you are batch processing thousands of these files and stuff, right? That is what we're doing. Again, not, not very, uh, like something, we didn't invent a machine learning algorithm or anything. We just found what is being used and we applied that to reduce the data. So this is a protocol that we gave to, you know, a Python script, essentially, we gave to Erdex saying that, hey, you guys can do this. You know, you can just do this. And uh, we also tested out our system for multi-wheel aircrafts as well. And we were able to identify multiple peaks and then actually cut off the tail and everything and isolate the particular events. So what, how did we check that? We actually like, we, we developed this algorithm Then we would go to the website, download like 15 random files and apply our algorithm. And for each file manually check everything and they satisfy. So that's what, that's what we're like, okay, this is good. We're good to go. So then we had a comparison of algorithms and this is basically what our algorithm is. For example, row seven, you have 22.5, 10.5, and 4.2. This is manually detected from the website. And we got, uh, or sorry, this is our algorithm. And this is what the Wolpert website shows, 22.31, 10.5 exact match, and 4.2 is 4.3. So exactly. Um, imagine the amount of data you are getting rid of. I think 0 0.1 PSI trade-off is nothing. I mean, we can easily live with that and stuff. So that's basically what we did is like, this, these are protocols developed for them so that they can implement. Then you can actually do look at the nature of the data that is there. Okay, this is just a frequency distribution of top of base, top of sub base and top of subgrade and how the frequencies are distributed over several months and stuff like that. And, and try to see what is, how the number of events. So this is in 2020 in the year 2020, how the uh, events were recorded and stuff like that, right? And there is a reason we are trying to look into that. The reason is, uh, I'm going to skip this because, okay, uh, well, this is 21 versus 2020, 2021 versus 2020 uh, on the comparisons. And again, you can see in 2021, there are some higher end aircraft or some higher end pressure levels that were not in 2020 or something. But then the bigger question comes is the following. So you are getting this data, right? So how much, how can we bet our money on that data is the question. That is the most important question. And that actually led to this thing called sensor reliability and response analysis. So then what we are saying is that, can we rely on the sensors? Are the sensors reliable? And what are the primary challenges? Here is what I wanted want you all to uh, Figure out. So this is a military uh, installation. So we are not allowed videographic uh, evidence. We cannot keep videos of aircrafts. There are no photographic evidences of which aircraft landed and everything. Okay. You can probably for a given given event, if you go through the proper channels, maybe you can confirm that was that a the C-17 did that land around that time on a particular day or something. But other than that, you have no idea what aircraft came. Not only that, there is no idea unless you go manually and check if it was a takeoff or a landing. There is no record of if it is a fully loaded aircraft or if it is a tanker, like in a fuel tanker, which is completely empty and it just came. There is no record of where it is with respect to the center line. For the center line, there was actually these laser distance meters were installed, but la laser distance four, which is uh, this one, this straight one, that never worked from day one. Okay, 
that never worked. That was dysfunctional. So out of the three, actually, another one, I don't remember which one actually gives, gives some uh, erroneous data as well. So the idea is, so let's take a look at the unknowns we have, okay? We don't know what gear configuration we are talking about. We don't know where the aircraft is. We don't know if it is landing or taking off. So we don't know the speed also. So for example, let's just say the aircraft is only applying 10 PSI of pressure on a sensor. Is that because it's actually a light aircraft or is that because it is at such a high speed? It is at such a high speed that it's actually having a lift off already and the pressure on the pavement is reduced. Without you going manually and checking about the events, there is no record available. Okay, so these are some of the challenges that are still remaining with respect to identifying what is an aircraft and if whether a special response, like we know everybody has seen the Atlas running and stuff like that, but we know how much load we are applying, then only we can we can uh, guess the sensor response if it is good or not. But without that, it's very, it's very difficult, right? So then what we did is we just started doing some preliminary analysis just based on data, okay? So what we would do is we would actually uh, take like, uh, so they, they actually went and did some uh, heavyweight deflectometer, HWD testing, periodic intervals, where they would actually put the load in at the particular sensor points and they would pump the pavement there and they would record the sensor response not only the pavement surface deflection that like any HWD would do, but they would also record like when I drop right on top of this R11 C3 TSB, this much load, what is the response of that pavement? So we have that data. We had, when we did this analysis, we had four events. So they, they, they kind of went almost twice a year, if you think about it, but some of the data was not very clear and stuff. But anyway, August, December, 2019, August 2020 and then January 2022. The, the, there was a file from 2021, but that was actually not uh, very reliable. I mean, the data looked very weird. So we didn't include this in the analysis. Okay. And then we just standardized that because, because again, this is HWD, right? You had you, you have varying amount of loads. So we did normalize that to 50,000 pounds. Yes, it is a linear approximation, all that. I know that, but but you know, we had to start somewhere. So we just did that. So here is what's going on. So let's let's just take a take a look at only this left part. This what where, where my laser pointer is. So August 2019, you have about 800 kPa. August 2020, you've had about you know 850, 900 kPa, so close to each other. And then December and January, which is winter, you you have similar numbers. So it's like okay, this this looks probably reasonable. But if you look at say for example. Uh, EPC, R6. If you look at here, R6, then what you uh, see, and then R2 as well, if you see here, like all these numbers are similar, right? If you look at them. And then all of a sudden from R6, R4, R, and R3, R2, these numbers became really, really big, right? So they are, that doesn't make any sense. It's the same pavement, right? It's the same pavement, just several feet away from each other. Why should the uh, similar load, why should the sensor response be so weird by certain sensors, right? Then we went into and everything and we did find out that for the top of base sensors, one side of the center line, they used earth pressure cells from a different vendor and everything else was from another vendor. So they did realize that that one different vendor that they used, those pressure cells started acting very erratic in some of the testing and those data had to be you know, discarded. So if you think about it, we're not doing any, any science, like any pure pavement engineering here. We're just comparing data here. And then we're saying that, okay, there are some outliers and everything. So, yeah, but some base was good, but there was one row that was missing again. When there's a missing data, there's nothing you can do about it. It's just missing. It was I'm not sure why or anything. And then subgrade, you know, everything was relatively comparable. So like, okay, looks like there's something wrong on this side of the so these, this, these sensors. And then you go into the asphalt strain gauges, and there is actually a lot of missing data in several locations. And also, uh, you know, the, some of the data is quite, quite inconsistent. So if you look at it here, R9C5 la longitudinal 
the strain value in August comes out to be about you know, 2,600 micro strains. Whereas here, just next to it, it is about what? 400 micro strains, right? So is this a you know, sensor damage due to installation? Is this connection problems? Is this calibration problems? Honestly, we don't know the answer uh, right now, right? So there is, there is a lot of, you know, uh, inconsistent data there are some missing data and also because because you know there is a lot of event data but how do you make sense of the event data without knowing the actual load being applied so the most reliable thing here is the hwd testing but even the hwd testing some of the data was quite inconsistent okay as i said in the introduction folks i mean there's a lot of questions we're still trying to uh, you know, figure out here when it's not a lot of, well, we don't know the answers to all of them, but this is just a, you know, challenges phase kind of a, kind of a uh, meeting, right? Uh, or a presentation. So then we did some back calculation uh, of moduli. We did use EKs in the very beginning, um, but we did run into some issues with EKs with some assumptions about temperature, blah, blah, blah. So just to expedite the process, we ended up using modulus, the, the one by text dot. Okay, and uh, yeah, for aircraft pay, airfield payment, that's probably not not very commonly used. But we did that because again, we were having issues with PKs. Uh, if if somebody wants to know details, we can talk later and stuff like that. And then we 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 calculated back calculated the modulus values. You know, trying to put the error values to small. So if you look at this, this is just a screenshot of August 2019. We have about two percent, three percent in the in the in the area errors and stuff like that, right? And then if you look here, what happens is EHMA, this is all in megapascals. So about 1100 megapascals. Then it goes to 12,000 megapascals in the December. And then again in August, it's about 1900. So and this is expected because in 2019, they constructed it. So it was probably a very, very fresh pavement. So the HMA is, 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 is probably you know, still being a little bit compacted and stuff like that. The air voids reducing, blah, blah, blah. And, and I think that's the reason it's very low. But if you go into December and January of the next couple of years, it's kind of in the ballpark. Uh, the E base uh, values 279, 352, 380, 482, it's kind of increasing slightly. And again, there is some belief that, you know, uh, there is some compaction of the base happening with time. Uh, in December and January, probably you are seeing some frost effects, you know, frozen ground kind of effects because this is Utah, as you. As you know, uh, how much of the compaction happens along below this thick airfield pavement? Again, open for interpretation. We don't know, but this is how we saw the results, right? 247 for subgrade, 247. Uh, what would that be? Divide by seven. It's probably about you know 30,000 psi, 30 ksi, or something like that for the subgrade and stuff. And, and in this analysis, the base and the subbase were combined into one layer and stuff. And then Okay, what we start, started doing is we said, okay, because we are trying to isolate sensors which are, which are good and which are bad and stuff like that. So we said, can we identify some upper bounds for expected values? So we actually set some low AC modulus and high AC modulus in the, in, in the winter and stuff. And we said that what is the maximum value if a very, very low modulus is assumed based on all the HWD data, what is the maximum value we should see for a given sensor under a given loading? And then maybe we can define some boundaries. So if you look at this slide, what we did is based on the maximum or minimum modulus assumption, which said the maximum stress, we kind of defined the uh, you know, upper bound. Then we give it, gave it 15 more percent of uh, tolerance. And we said, if you are above this, then really, really the problem is with the sensor, most likely. Again, though you can ask me that is the layer, linear elastic calculations or layered elastic calculation, are they going to give reasonable values? Will viscoelastic get, give better? Absolutely. Will stress dependent calculations give better? Absolutely. But I think going by the minimum modulus, uh, maximum stress and then giving it 15%, we are kind of identifying that and that, or uh, accounting for that. And look at this. This is the August uh, earth pressure cells and all of these pressure cells are still above that value as well. 
So why is this? So if you sit down with a uh, with your computer and then do everything manually, it is it is a very straightforward thing to us uh, find out, right? You can estimate some values and stuff. But remember, we are developing this where where the user is blind to whatever is up, uh, uh, you know happening and then capture like an algorithm to capture all of this, right? So this is basically where we did some of the you know measured versus predicted what was measured in term in terms of the apply what is the applied load you put that applied load in something like win julia and then you can calculate like you know, 833 versus uh predicted is 717 254 versus 222 51 versus 86 so then there is like a percent error calculation and stuff like that to identify okay which uh, which uh sensors are doing good which sensors are doing bad and stuff like that i Realize 235. I'm probably just out of time. So I'm going to just show you one, a couple more things. In fact, I have only two more slides. Uh, and then we actually said that, okay, uh, uh, what, what is the uh, percent error? Where is the percent error? How is the pavement doing with time and stuff like that? So we, we, we calculated all of that. Then we went into some typical events from winter, spring, and summer. So if you typically identify so once you have identified which sensors are good, right? Because remember, what is the objective? Objective of all day is to use this data to validate this model and stuff like that. But how do you identify what sensors are reliable, what sensors are not reliable, and what has gone bad and what has not gone bad and everything? So all this work that you saw, first you filter the data, then you reduce the data, then you bring everything, do like a sensor reliability or survivability check, then you identify, okay, these sensors like R8, R10, R and R8 for everything. So these are doing good. So then if you compare them, then you see, do start seeing some trends like that. Okay, top of base is greater than top of sub base, greater than top of subgrade. And as you go down, the pulse width increases. So this is what you would expect in a standardized or a well-performing instrumented system. Right, but the whole idea right now, the challenge is, what is a well? Uh, uh, I mean, how to identify those good instruments, which is what we we were doing. And the other thing is, how do you isolate the loading? How do you know what is the loading that caused this? And the answer to that is still we don't know. We are trying to do some, you know, back analysis using some machine learning, just just develop like a synthetic database with. Well, we don't, you know, Kostov has generated all different aircrafts and then all different gear positions. He has tried to calculate where under a 777, under a F-15C Eagle, where can all the, you know, what is the logical assumptions on gear positions and what are the, uh, you know, stress values based on, you know, some modulus values, generic like boundary modulus values. Then you compare them. Then you go back to your actual event like this and then try to, predict what kind of aircraft there is because right now there is no record and so far we have not been very successful in using whatever the laser distance meter data is to make a lot of meaningful uh, uh, assertions about the location so that's basically what it is so it's just as i said you know, these are some uh, specific findings for the study but the whole idea just to recap is we're trying to do a uh, uh, identify sensors that we can actually rely on to further because if you want to validate a cplex or something you really want to have a good sensor data otherwise you will question your model for no reason whereas it can actually be from a sensor and stuff that's essentially the whole objective uh, thank you very much for your time uh, this is my research group uh, here at osu and they are the ones who, who do um, all the hard work and stuff like that so that's it and javier i think about over time about four minutes. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take. Thank you. We have any questions from the room? Mama, can we check if we have some questions on the list? Yeah, sure. But I, I had a question. Yeah, go ahead. You're, you're a question in the room. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and thank you, Professor, for the nice presentation. I have a, a, a very quick question. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned that you reduce the size of the data by cutting off the zero values, for example, um, in the pressure cell data. 
Uh, I'm assuming this works for pressure cell, but not really for the asphalt strain gauges, right? Because they will have some residual strains. Uh, how did you deal with that? So we we actually identified that's a very good question. We actually kind of identified the baseline uh, of I mean whatever that is and stuff like that, and then tried to see how much difference in the peak was happening because of the passage of the load, right? And after that, after that, you are very right. So maybe before the event and after the event, there may be some difference in the value because of residuals and stuff like that. I think that's what you're referring to, right? Yes, but yes. What, what we did is for this, because, because if you do like a layered elastic analysis or something like that, what is what it is going to predict is just the effect or delta, delta epsilon is what it will predict, right? Not just residual or something. So right now for this work, we are focusing on the delta epsilon rather than the permanent change in the epsilon. I hope that makes sense. Yes, yes, thank you. And, and I had another question if, if I can, sorry. Uh, professor, you mentioned about calculating, I'm not very familiar with the method you mentioned for calculating the, back calculating the modulus uh, with, with the heavyweight deflectometer data. But I was wondering if you, if you try to use the GPR data with the heavyweight deflectometer data to predict the modulus. So the GPR was just used for uh, for layer thickness uh, verifications after construction. And then they just gave us the GPR or the layer thicknesses. So we just used like whatever the thicknesses they gave. I mean, if your answer is, if, did we did we change the thickness of the pavement from spot to spot and everything? The answer is no. It was oh, yes, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, Professor, I did have a... Uh, a question about about the project. Is this an ongoing project, and what are the next steps? Are you so going to this, the data for for something? That's a very good question, Javier. So the uh, technically on papers, if this is an ongoing project, the answer is no because the funding has ended. But if it research wise, if it is an ongoing start project, this answer is yes because my student Kostu, his PhD is focusing on this, and so we are trying to do that. So we are trying to analyze many different things like, for example, uh, how can you, again, I mean, just as I said, the challenges, right? We don't know the loading challenge values and stuff like that. So we are trying to develop like a synthetic database of maybe, you know, thousands of runs of, of, uh, of aircrafts or something at different positions and try to see if there is an, in, in an educated uh, manner, we can predict uh, what, what uh, aircraft was passing, of causing what event and stuff. And also uh, damage, right? You know, this is actually, I didn't get a chance to uh, consider. So let's just say that is 100 aircraft that are passing, right? Uh, uh, those of you who work in airfield pavements, you know something called pass to coverage ratio and stuff like that. So if 100 passes, is that actually 100 passes? Or from our strains, what it's looking at is that even for very, very big aircraft, the strain levels are the pressure levels are very small. So maybe we are not doing as much damage to the pavement as we thought we were doing. So how is that information going to help as we move forward in our you know, service life predictions and stuff like that? That's not an immediate task right now, but again, that's the generic direction we are moving into. Thank you. Thank you for, for that. I see Professor Tutumler on the screen. Go ahead, Professor. Hi, uh, ho hopefully you can help me. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yes, yes Professor, how are you? Hi, hi, Deb, uh, a very good presentation. <laughs> good, thank good, thank you. Uh, I was I was wondering about a couple things. Uh, first, uh, we did the complete characterization of all the materials uh, in the lab uh, of, of the base, sub-base, uh, sub soils and everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I hope you got all of that information uh, in detailed analyses. You mentioned your student will be working on. Uh, hopefully, we will have some opportunity to be able to actually do more, uh, you know, uh, in-depth analyses and back calculations and things, uh, uh, you know, related to actually taking into account some of the uh, advanced material characterization information. So that's one question uh, comment you may have on that. Uh, the second one is, I, I believe you mentioned up front the smart sensors, the vendor element sensor and the smart rack. Uh, yeah. Did you end up with doing anything with those or, 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 or you know, so, just 
So, so honestly, Professor, I'll answer the second question. I actually wanted some information from the Bender elements because to check the modulus and everything. And Jeb Tingle's straight answer was that that's Errol's toy. I want Errol to play with it, not you to play with it. <laughs> so, right. So, so if you if you if you think that we can, you know, uh, augment each other and maybe work together to publish something together, I would actually love to have some of the Bender element data if you have them. I did once absolutely, ask absolutely, absolutely. There's room for us to uh, dig a little deeper and understand better, uh, you know, the trends from the data you collected and analyzed, as well yeah. as look at more on the Bender element data. Yeah, I would, I would love to do that. But Jeff Tingle basically spanked me, saying that you know that's Errol's toy. I don't want you to mess with it. Said, okay, <laughs> that's, that's good. <laughs> so, so did, uh, did you get the material characterization information from our uh, studies? Yeah. Well, the answer is no, but that is not because they did not share. The answer is because when I heard that you guys were doing something, I said, "Hey guys, can I use some of that data?" And then they were, their answer was that, "Hey." Uh, you know, we have the HWD. So if you are to assume uh, or if you are to use some modulus for your forward calculations and stuff, we would rather want you to use the HWD ones based or rather than, you know, worry about a lab one and then maybe do a C factor or whatever, whatever and stuff. So that is the reason. But I think uh, moving forward, you actually sparked my memory. I would actually love to have some of that data because for Kostu, when he's generating the synthetic database, it may actually help to use some of the lab tested values and and see what what happens and stuff yeah i think if, if you could email us on that uh if we will get the jab in the loop and and hopefully that will be possible for us to share with you and, and, and that way that will help your student and we can get a little more understanding from the data analysis uh yeah 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 absolutely thank you yeah all right good job thanks professor Mishra, we do have one last question here from the from the audience we were wondering how are the responses that you're seeing from military aircrafts, you know, interesting or special compared to a commercial aircraft? Well, on the lighter side, heavier, I don't know what response I am seeing because I don't know the aircraft type, right? So that's that's actually, if you, I mean, that's just a, on the lighter side, uh, the answer. Now the, you know, gear, some of the gear configurations you do see, uh, uh, it's similar to you know like Boeing triple seven is a Boeing triple seven right it's uh, it doesn't really have much much difference but the but the cargo aircrafts are significantly heavier so the 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 loads are going to be uh, very very big but again remember I don't know right now at least where the aircraft is passing right so is the is the pressure cell recording is that because the gear was nearby or very far or something that answer I still I'm not educated enough to give you. So that's basically a vague answer to your question. I'm sorry, but yeah. Great. Well, I don't. We don't have any more questions here in the room, and uh, we're running out of time. So we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up. Professor Mishra, thank you very much for the interesting lecture. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Good to see. Good to see you out.